Welcome home. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I know the Lord liveth and bless me, the rock that God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth and bless me, the rock that everyone. Is it a good day to be at church? There you go. There you go. And is it a good day for those of you that are joining us online? Is it a good day to be at church online? Yes, it is. <laughs> I didn't hear a whole lot, but you know, <laughs> it's good to have everybody here this morning. It looks like we got a good crowd. Uh, last week we had a lot of the women out of out down in Branson at the Women of Joy conference, and so it's good to have everybody back. And, uh, and it's good to have smiling faces. Is that true? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So real quick uh, disclaimer. Um, I usually try to type up, when I'm making announcements, try to type up my notes, you know, using lots of colors so I can see it and everything, because it's amazing when you're standing up here, your mind goes absolutely blank, you know? Hi, what's my name? I have no idea what my name is, you know? So um, my notes are still on the printer back at the house, and... <laughs> So um, Mitch and I are going to be doing things from memory, only he was able to prepare, and so we'll see how my part goes. Um, first of all, welcome everyone, welcome to those of you that are online and that type of thing. If you were a guest of ours this morning, um, <clears throat> we are so glad you're here. Um, it is a blessing for you to be here. You bless us when you come. And so, amen. And so, so stick around for a few minutes afterwards so we can say hi to you, shake your hand, and get to know you just a little bit. We would like a record of you being here. Um, you'll notice there's some cars in the rack right in front of you there. If you'll grab one of those and fill it out on the right side, the correct side, the side that talks about guests, then we would appreciate that. Um, in a minute, also, if you have not gotten a communion thing, um, uh, we will be passing those out. If you want to run, go get it uh, now. That's a great time to do that, too. Uh, <laughs> on your mark, get set, go. Um, and, uh, but we will be bringing those to you here in just a few minutes um, when it's appropriate time. Um, uh, also, um, oh, and by the way, on those cards, if you have a prayer request, the elders try to pray about all, all the, a bunch of prayer requests every Wednesday night after class. And, and so we, uh, if you have a prayer request you would like us to specifically pray about, Take one of those cards and fill it out and drop it in the box. By the way, if you're a guest here, when you're through filling out that card, you can drop it in one of the collection boxes. There's one out by the Welcome Center out here, and there's one out by the North Door out there. Or just give it to somebody, and we'll take care of it for you. Um, also, let's see. Uh, be sure you get a bulletin. If you haven't already got one, be sure you get one, because there's lots of important information in there. So uh, have four announcements, uh, and then we'll, then we'll begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> uh, first of all, um, the deacons and Gary Howe do a great job of manning, managing this congregation's finances. Uh, they really do a good job. And, um, and as you know, over the, over the last years, um, uh, organization's finances, whether it's our individual finances, whether it's this congregation's finances, whether it's corporations, whatever, it's been a challenge, hasn't it? 
And so um, uh, East Independence is in the same category. And there, the Deacons and Gary are doing a very good job of managing things. But on the last financial statements that I saw, we, um, we were down about 30% on our contributions. So I want to remind everyone, be sure you are diligent in giving the amount that you've planned to give. Uh, as you know, we can, we can put it in the collection boxes that I just mentioned. You can mail it to, to the church. You can use the church app. You can use your bank check and, and send it that way. Whatever's a good way for you, make sure you are diligent in giving your contributions so that this congregation can function like the, the deacons and the ministry leaders have planned. Um, announcement number two, Great Beginnings Preschool is looking for a teacher for the upcoming school year that starts in September. Preschool meets on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, and teachers' hours are 8.30 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. And so if you're interested in filling, applying for that position, uh, talk to uh, Liz Rush, please, Elizabeth Rush. The second annual Love Like Olivia Day is coming up soon. It is next Sunday. Um, so please make plans to participate. Uh, we're still needing a few things donated. Uh, they're looking for some $10 Bass Pro gift, gift cards and some store-bought, store-bought baked goods. Um, and, of course, you can also make some uh, monetary donations. Uh, there are flyers all around the building talking about this um, and, so, uh, and, and directions and that kind of stuff. So please have your donations here to the church building on next Sunday, by next Sunday. Place them in the basket on the tall stage in the fellowship hall. That way. Okay? And, of course, if you have any questions, please contact Michelle Smith or Lindsay Hunt. And finally, um, Mother's Day Boutique uh, is planned for May 4th. There's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center if you'd like to help with this, and you can talk to Kelly Henley if you have any questions about that. I would encourage you to focus on several of those events. Uh, Love Like Olivia Day is an awesome thing. Uh, the mother's, mother's Boutique is a spectacular thing that is so meaningful to, to the, the folks that get to participate in that. Uh, so um, I would encourage you to focus on those, be involved in those, give what you can in whatever way, whether it's monetary or of yourself. So would you bow with me, please, as we begin our, our time of worship? Our God and our Father, we are so blessed to be able to be here together and to have you with us. Father, I pray that as we focus our minds and our attention on, on what you have done for us, the salvation that you have given us, and how we can reflect Jesus to others, whether it's here this morning or whether it's throughout our, our activities of each day and each week, I pray that you will motivate us, that you will help us be focused on what we should be doing as your people, and that you will keep Satan away from us. Father, I pray that you will forgive our sins as we know that you do, as you do for your children. And Father, I pray that as we uh, begin our time of worship, that our minds and our, will be focused on who you are and what you have done for us. And it's through Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> theme of our song and uh, our communion this morning is going to be centered around um, of our the, uh, the theme of we don't have to surrender to fear, but we can trust that God has made a way for us to find deliverance. And I hope you'll be encouraged this morning. <clears throat> I will mention that you need to pay it be on your toes because I'm not singing all of a lot of things. You'll just kind of have to be sure you watch the screen. <clears throat> My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. All glory be to Christ our King. All I'm not a 
Daniel chapter 3, verses 12 through 30. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed, their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
be cut into pieces and their house turn in, houses turn into piles of rubble. For no other god can save in this way. Then the, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. God will make a way. communion supplies, if you'll raise your hand, some of our young folks will deliver that out to you at this time. Come, now is the time to worship. Good morning. Uh, 
Uh, this morning, I'm going to be uh, kind of uh, reading and talking through a section of scripture um, from Hebrews chapter 10, um, verses 1 uh, through 24. Um, when I was preparing for this, I'm reminded that this phrase kept coming to me um, that cleanliness is next to godliness. And actually, if you Google search that, one of the things you'll find is that what comes up a lot is a question about where can you find that in the Bible? Well, you can't actually find that in the Bible. In the Bible, however, you can find themes of it all throughout, and this chapter is one of those sections. And so, um, I'll, I'll kind of bring that theme up a couple of different times. So, starting in verse one, it says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, if you know anything about trying to make things clean, you'll know that the work really is never done. In fact, when you clean something, it's only clean for that moment of time, and it immediately begins to get dirty again. Um, it's a frustrating thing about keeping things clean or trying to do so. Um, and in this way, you know, people um, that lived under Old Testament law really um, had to constantly maintain cleanliness, but they did so in a reactive way, making sacrifices reactively, um, making them clean again, but not for long. The work was never done. In verse 5, it says, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First, he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So the reminder here is that Jesus is our way. Jesus is our path to cleanliness that, that is long lasting and that um, allows us to have a relationship and a covenant with God. This time of our service is a reminder of that covenant and of that sacrifice made on our behalf. Um, and while we partake of these emblems here in just a moment, I hope um, it's a reminder to you as well um, of the commitment that, that uh, we make to him and the gratefulness we have um, for his sacrifice. At this time, will you bow with me, please? Dear Lord, thank you um, for this opportunity to come before you fully aware of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf with Jesus taking our place um, and dying for our sins and being an offering to you that allows us to have a relationship with you and that allows us to be clean in your sight. At this time, as we partake of this bread, um, help it to be a reminder of us, of his body that he shed uh, and died on the cross for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
continue in in that scripture um, Hebrews chapter 10 we're going to start in verse 18 and it says and where these have been forgiven sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary therefore brothers and sisters since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way opened up for us through a curtain that is his body and since we have a great priest over the house of God let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Will you bow with me, please? Dear Lord, once again we come before you, thankful of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us fully aware of how inept we are without it, fully aware of how in need we are of his blood that washes over us. At this time, as we partake of this through the vine, help us to do so in a way that pleases you and help us to do so with commitment and recommitment to the covenant that we have between Jesus and you. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. stand as we sing the next two songs. <sighs> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but holy
Miss the Children's Church, and Rob, come preach the word. Good morning. Good morning. A couple of things before I actually get started into the lesson. One thing is, anybody else find it a little ironic that the blind guy told us to keep our eyes on the slides there as we were going through so, the, today? So, um, Secondly, you know, great, great job, Mitch. Great, great songs. And with the verses that Carl read and the verses that Casey read, I'm kind of superfluous up here at this moment. I mean, that was that was wonderful, guys. That was that was wonderful. Um, and so, and then uh, one more thing before I get started, I want to um, thanks, thank, and recognize. Uh, a couple of our visitors here today, because my best friend Kevin and his son Colt are here, and Kevin's been my best friend for forty-ish years. Um, and you know, and you know, he does stuff like support me when I'm doing stuff like this and everything. And so, you know, I, I appreciate him being here. And my mom is also here, and she's been my mom for fifty years. So <laughs> she's got your beat, Kev. You know. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, I, I I'm glad that I appreciate both of them being here. Um, when I started, I guess that wasn't when I started preparing this lesson. I'll talk about that for a second. But last week I noticed on um, Facebook, you know, you look at the Facebook memories, and last week I had realized because of that, last Sunday was ten years since I had first got up here and, and done a lesson, um, and so I. When seeing that, I realized that I probably don't have to write anything new. I can start recycling stuff now. So, um, but I didn't. I went. I went with something new. Um, and I and this was originally scheduled for the beginning of March, um, but we made way for um, Jeremy and and Mitch's presentation on India um, because of that. And then. Uh, I was going to be bumped a week, but Roger knew that he was going to be gone a couple of weeks this month, so he asked me to change it again to this this month. And I had a lesson planned out, knew what I was going to talk about, and I was going to come out here and just unload both barrels and you know and and get after it. But then, within that time frame, Roger, in one of his lessons, he was he was talking about, um, and he used verse Second Timothy two twenty five that opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant the repentance lead to them to a knowledge of the truth. And so you know, that made me reconsider some of that. And so then I actually thought, well, you know, we'll get on Rob's soapbox and, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what's, what's the biggest ill in the world um, and how to fix it. But then I thought, well, maybe I won't do that either because I, as I was doing some training just recently within the last couple of weeks, um, I, I and it was a it was National Traffic Safety Institute is where I was doing doing the training with and it was um, very basic knowledge and stuff like that it wasn't anything um, outstanding but the formula that they used to present it was excellent and I looked at that and I thought you know what that'll preach as Roger would say um, and so. That's that's what I ended up adapting to today, and we'll actually maybe talk a little bit about you know what I consider to you know to be the biggest problem of the world today. Um, but you know if not, we'll get to that at some point down the road. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today, as you can see, the title of this is the Christian Equation. Um, I'm going to be talking algebra while we're up here uh, while I'm up here today. So um, we're doing we're doing math. Um, I know you know Tristan, go ahead take your nap. I mean. We had good uplifting stuff up until this point, so I know math is going to put some people to sleep. Uh, but we're, we're going to look at an equation, and is it, this there are 
several, or a, a, a few anyway, variables within, in, within this equation. Um, and it's just a simple um, additional addition equation. And so we got the add-ins and the sum, and we know that they have to balance out and have to be in balance once it's all said and done. And that's how an equation works. And so as we're going into this, I'm going to look at some of these variables within this equation and, and what these vari variables are. And again, through the lens and the viewpoint of this is the Christian equation. And so these, these are some of the, the variables. And the first is knowledge. It's up there on the board now. And knowledge is an awareness or understanding of facts, information, or skills acquired through education, investigation, observation, or experience. So it's an awareness or understanding of facts. And so, you know, some of this knowledge that's important to the Christian equation, um, and as, I, as we're studying all these variables, uh, this is not, none of these are a in total list. I'm not going to cover everything possible to cover. Um, you know, this is, could actually be developed and probably will be used as a uh, class guide at some point for me down the road. Um, and so I've got six and a half pages of notes. I'm only going to use six of them. So, um, <laughs> well, but I'm not covering everything. These, these are, these are some, some basics that should be a part of the, the Christian equation. Um, and so knowledge, you know, knowledge that is important to Christians or should be important to Christians or may even lead us to become a Christian. And I'm going to share some of this, what I believe these knowledge factors should be, um, but I'm going to try to let Scripture do most of the talking uh, about the importance of them and, and what we should know. And I'm going to start with, you know, the fact that God is in charge. You know, that is knowledge that we should have. And I could um, expound on that, but I'm going, to, I'm going to let David do it and read 1 Chronicles 29, 10, 10 through 12. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. And so, that is knowledge that we should possess. You know, that, those are things that are important to know, to recognize that God is in charge. Also, you know, one of the basic things that knowledge that we should be grasping a hold of was the fact that, you know, Jesus came, he died, and he was resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and, he, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the twelve. Basic knowledge that we have to grasp and, and, and be aware of. Facts that we need to understand. And then the last one that I'm going to share as far as knowledge-wise is why these verses that we just read took place. These are verses that everybody in here is going to know, but it, it does a good job of explaining what I'm trying to say. And that is, you know, why, why he, he died and was raised again. John three sixteen through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. These are some very basic knowledge that we need to grasp and we need to understand. We need to fully understand those. And, and we need to know these things as Christians. The next variable that we're going to look at is, or are, is values or value. Um, and again, this is, this is the Christian equation, so we're, we're putting these things to this viewpoint. And values are the importance, worth, or usefulness of something, or one's judgment of what is important in life. And so as we're considering the Christian equation, I want to look at some values that are important to God. Um, and we'll go over some verses that, that explain that. Um, one of those, the first one, I, I have six listed. Again, not an all-inclusive list. There are lots of things. Um, but one are relationships. You know, God placed a great importance or great value on relationships. John 13 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Um, and that will actually, we'll talk about love even as one of the things that he values highly as well. Um, but, you know, relationships. And as he, you know, even Jesus, he, he took 12 other guys and spent years with them building a relationship so that those guys could go out and build more relationships. You know, and why do that? Because the most powerful force in the world is a relationship. People will do for love what they will do for no other reason. Um, you know, and, and those are, you know, that is highly important to God. Another is peace. Another thing that he values and places high importance on is peace. Um, you know, and Matthew 5, 9 tells us, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You know, God and Jesus placed a high value on peace. And even um, Romans 12, which we'll get to later, talks about, you know, as much as it depends on you, you know, live peaceably with everyone. Um, and so there is a lot of, you know, value placed on peace. Jesus was the Messiah and, and Savior that did not, take over and reign, um, did not take over and, and, and reign through force and power. He chose peace. He did it through peace. So peace is something that is very valuable and, and that God puts a high, high value on. Another is faith. Uh, that's, God also places a high value on faith. Hebrews 11, 5 through 6, By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commanded as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith, he places a lot of value on faith. It's impossible to please him without faith. I mean, we're, we're told that, so it, there's high value on that. Another is gratitude. He places a lot of value on gratitude. It's mentioned 157 times in the Bible. I know that that's not the most mentioned thing or anything, but obviously 157 times that gratitude is mentioned in there, it's probably pretty important. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for us Again, this could be some knowledge that's important to have. Is, you know, what's God's will for your life? But God's will for us is that because we know Jesus, we can be thankful no matter what. We should, be, we should have gratitude. Um, forgiveness. You know, these last two that I have, I've gone through four. I've got two more that I want to go over. And the last two are huge. You know, the, these are um, foundational types of values for God. Forgiveness. We're even told to include forgiveness in our prayers. We're told that the whole point of Jesus being sent was 
to forgive our sins you know, so that we may have eternal life. I'm going to read Mark 6, 7 through 15. Uh, and you'll recognize these. Again, a lot of these verses I've been using are very well known. Um, and you've heard them a lot before, but that's okay. That's because they have something important to say. That's, that's why we hear them a lot. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Forgiveness is the basis of a lot of these other values and a lot of our knowledge is this forgiveness. And the last one that I have I referred to earlier is love. God obviously placed a high value and a high importance on love. It is the um, utmost importance in Matthew 22, 36 through 39, even as the Pharisee is asking, um, what is the greatest commandment? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so just as a quick recap, looking at those values, going back through them, we looked at relationships, peace, faith, gratitude, forgiveness, and love. And again, there's lots of other stuff that we can see as, we're, as you're going through Scripture that God places value on. There's lots of other things in there. Um, prayer, obviously, is one that pops into my mind right off the top of my head that he placed a lot of importance on. The next variable that we're going to look at within this equation are attitudes. And so they're, 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 they did a good job of building the equation for me up here on the screen. Mitch, if you can't see it, it's got knowledge and then plus values and now plus attitudes. Um, attitudes are a learned tendency to evaluate things in a certain way. This can include evaluations of people, issues, objects, or events. The way you feel about something or someone, or a particular feeling or opinion. <clears throat> and there are several factors that can affect the strength of our attitudes as we're thinking about this stuff. One of those factors is knowledge of the subject. How well you know the subject and again, we're talking about the Christian equation here. So how well you know and understand God's will, how, how well you know and understand Scripture, those things can influence how strong your attitude is about that. Um, another thing that affects our attitude, how strong our attitude is, is expectation of a favorable outcome. If you think this is going to turn out good for me, you're going to feel pretty strong about it. You know, this is, that, that is something that can affect your attitude. The third factor affecting that is personal experience. Your personal experience with whatever this is that, that, that we're discussing an attitude about, um, your personal experience with that can affect how strong your attitude is. And... Uh, and then lastly, repetition. This is something that comes up all the time. This is something that you spend time on. It can affect your attitude about it. You know, my attitude on the affairs of, I don't know this, you know, the affairs of Mexico, Missouri. You know, that's a town that I know nothing about. I don't ever go there. I know where it's at. My attitude towards the affairs of Mexico, Missouri, sorry, Larry, because I know you were up there for a while, um, is our, my attitude is, it doesn't matter a whole lot to me. You know, I, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me. I'm not all that concerned about it. And so that, 
that repetition, that knowledge of those things, the, you know, the, the favorable outcome, once again, you know, even Mexico, Missouri, who's mayor, it's not going to make my life any better. So, yeah, my, my attitude towards it is, is pretty small, um, is, is, is very weak. So I, it's not real strong. So those things can affect how strong your attitude is. And so you've got those three variables added together. Knowledge plus values plus attitudes equals behavior. Behavior is defined as the manner of conducting oneself, a visible and observable action or set of actions. And again, we've been building the Christian equation here, so not an all-inclusive list. I have to keep reminding myself of that. Um, but how does a Christian behave then? And I'm going to use Romans 12, 9 through 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, and just as a side note, if you want me to get started about what is the greatest problem in the world today, it is selfishness. Um, and that is, that is it right there. If I was, when I get up on my soapbox and do that lesson, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who curse you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And as I'm going through these, think, of, think about how your behavior relates to that. And I, I say that because as I'm reading that, I, I was thinking, I do a pretty good job of not being proud most of the time. I do not do a good job of being willing to associate with those of lowly position. And, you know, and you know, that's something I need to work on. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And this one I really struggle with. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Pretty good list of behaviors. Pretty good list of things to do. Not an easy list. Um, and... I could go on. This is where I'm actually skipping notes and have this built out as a lesson. I'm going to skip those two whole pages of notes so that we can move on. And so, now we have that, that equation. Knowledge plus values plus attitudes equal behavior. That's the equation that I stole from National Traffic Safety Institute um, and, and decided to use it for this, this lesson. And so, consider... Now I'm going to go back and kind of put these knowledge and values and attitudes together and, and help us think about them a little bit. Consider what, where your not knowledge level is. Do you know? Are you aware and understand that God is in charge? Are you aware? Do you know? Do you understand that Jesus died for your sins? Do you know that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Do you understand? Do you know? What is your knowledge about what God's will is for your life? As you're thinking about this, considering these things, again, not an all-inclusive list, but think about your knowledge of God in your life and, and how you relate to God and how, how you react with God. Rate your knowledge on a scale of 1 to 10. That's going to be that first valuable that we're filling in in this equation. Rate 
you know, rate your knowledge at where, where you rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10. Values. What importance do you place on the things that God places importance on? We looked at six values. Um, relationships, peace, faith, gratitude, forgiveness, and love. We looked at those six values. What importance do you place on those values? We know that God places high importance on them, but what importance do you place on them? And again, think about those six things on a scale of 1 to 10. Where do you rate yourself? Your total score would be 0 to 60. If you think, you know, if you want to do, do that, lump it all together and come up with a number between 0 and 60, that's fine. But it was relationships, peace, faith, gratitude, forgiveness, and love. That's the second number that we're... That's the second variable that we're filling in now in our equation. Third variable, what is your attitude towards God? What is your attitude towards what He wants to do with your life? Maybe even as you're considering that, it helps to consider what is your attitude towards the world before you rate, rate yourself. What is your attitude towards your own desires? And remember that there are Things as you're thinking about that, I want to, you know, use these factors that we talked about that influence the strength of your attitude, and then rate your attitude on a scale of one to ten. And those factors again were knowledge of, sub, of the subject. So how much do you know? How much do you really understand? How much do you really know? How much do you really grasp and, and take hold of about what God is doing in your life? Number the the second factor is the expectation of a favorable outcome. Hopefully, you have an expectation of a favorable outcome as you're considering what God has done for you and how, how God is acting in your life. Your personal experience. Consider that. How has God has worked it? How has God worked in your life? And repetition. Is this something that you won't, is this a subject and what God is doing for you and how God is acting in your life? Is this a subject that you only concentrate on once a week, on Sunday morning maybe, or is this something that is um, ongoing? Is this something, so consider those things and rate that yourself on your, your attitude on a scale of 1 to 10. Total it all up, and you should be somewhere between 0 and 80. And so, think about that for a second, total it all up, you should be somewhere between 0 and 80. Now, insert that number into the behavior part of the equation. The higher that number, the more Christ-like a person should be acting. Right? I mean, that makes sense. Um, you know, so does the number you came up with for yourself fit the behavior of somebody that you would expect of that number? Um, those... If your total score is high, but your behavior and actions don't match, or if the behavior and actions don't match, um, you know, then that's not a balanced equation. An equation has to balance out. It has to work out. And so those numbers should line up and make sense. If they don't, you'll have tension and anxiety in your life. You won't be at peace. You'll struggle with peace that, that there's a lot of value on. Um, and... If those numbers, if you give yourself whatever score on knowledge, values, and attitudes, and it doesn't line up with behavior, then you're going to feel that tension or you're lying to yourself. You might be a really good liar and, and are able to get by with it. That's, you know, to use the psychological term, that's where the cognitive dissonance comes in. Um, but, and so if I look at my behavior and I start thinking about those variables that equal that behavior, it might cause me to rethink. If I'm looking at my behavior, do I really know and understand God's will? How much do I really value relationships or peace or forgiveness? You know, because like I can say that I place a high value on relationships. But in reality, when I look at my behavior, I place high value on certain relationships. You know, if I'm being honest with myself, there are, I don't do a great job at starting new relationships or building, you know, new relationships. 
And so, you know, if I'm going to be honest with myself, my, I, I can say I value relationships, but my behavior doesn't match that. Um, and then what is your attitude towards God? You know, are you grateful for all the opportunities you have? Do you recognize everything that he's done in your life and everything he's given you? Um, and so what I ask you to do going forward is think about that equation, see if it's balanced, um, and it could be balanced that there's still certain things you want to work on. You know, what do you need to work on for it to balance out? What do you need to work on to get that total number higher so that we can behave and act and be more Christ-like? That's what I want you to think about, you know, knowledge. How much do you know? What can you do to, to increase your knowledge of God? Values. What consider? Stop and consider what is really important in your life by looking at where you spend your time and energy. And attitude, what thoughts and emotions color the way you evaluate things. And then behavior, what behaviors need to change to help you achieve that balance and make it level out. Thank you. Jeremy? Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> I'm really bad at math, <laughs> so, so I gloss over sometimes. But I got, while you were talking, I got to thinking about something. Um, I know how to change own, my own oil in my car. But I value my time more than I value my money, so I often pay someone else to do it. And I had an experience a while ago where I kept taking my, well, I took my car to a certain shop twice, well, it's quick change oil places, and then had to repair my car twice because it kept cracking like the oil cooler. There's a spec. Knowledge says you tighten it this tight and do it by hand. And whether they know that or not, I don't know. But the behavior was they cranked that thing down and cracked it. Now I have oil leak. So when I think about, hey, where am I going to change, take my car to change the oil? I'm looking for somebody competent or somebody I perceive to be competent. I don't take my car there. And I don't recommend them when asked. Are we a people whose behavior demonstrates that we are Christians? Or are we a people who sometimes when people interact with us, there's a caveat that comes with it? That person should know. They claim to know. But the behavior doesn't re re represent that. I think sometimes we're guilty of that, right? And like Rob says, sometimes it depends on who the person is. Simple question, did Jesus ever have a caveat on who the person was and then adjusted his behavior accordingly? Or did he show love to everybody equally? We as a people, do we do that? There might be some work to do there. The other thing that I was thinking about Sometimes I think that we get head knowledge that we need to be saved. That sits up here. But then our knowledge starts to fall off because we may make lip service to that we realize that we don't, we're not guaranteed our next breath. But we can wait. Those two aren't in sync, are they? Or... God accepts us as we are because he's the one doing the atoning work. But you know what? I need to clean this up first. Knowledge and actions are not in sync, are they? Something's out of balance, as Rob would say, right? This equation is not equal. Or we'll take, and because we have a lack of knowledge on how God says you're supposed to be added to the body, We've bought into what the world says, hey, here's an easier way. Or if you just live good enough, eventually you can take care of this. Once again, knowledge, behavior, and attitude aren't in sync. At this time, the elders will be standing around the room, and I want, I want you to spend a moment thinking about that. Are my actions, one, if I'm a Christian, if I claim to be a Christian, am I a person who... Someone would definitively say, you know what, I recommend you go to 
just like a shop, right? Or is there a caveat? We might have something to work on. Or if you're someone who knows that you need to accept Christ, but you've been just waiting, or you're good enough, I challenge you to reconsider that. We, we have this opportunity for you to come and join us in prayer. If you need prayers of encouragement, areas where you need to be strengthened or need to be encouraged in that. If you've been the victim of somebody behaving in an unchristlike way and you have hurts, and now forgiveness is something we need to work on. Bring those. We'll be happy to pray. Because here's the thing. We struggle with it every day. I did not have the best Friday. I had someone get underneath my skin, and I didn't always handle it. I think what came out of my mouth and my behaviors were fine, but the attitude spinning in my head was not. That's not Christ-like. I have to own that. If this is the time, and there is no better time that you put Christ on as your Savior, that you do it his way, not your way. Your behavior finally matches your knowledge and your attitude and your value. We invite you to come and pray with us, and we will guide you in that. Mitch? Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty.